So at least I'm going to take you through a, a more factual account uh, of the state of the uh, cooperative uh, economy, uh, as we would call it, uh, in the UK, uh, but also internationally. And I know there's, there's a number of people from uh, different countries uh, uh, here on the course. So I'm going to start with a, uh, a short and uh, beautifully upbeat uh, film, short video uh, that we uh, recorded uh, around the theme of there is an alternative, uh, which is the, the cooperative model. It's all in the word cooperation. It's about working together towards a common aim. Because that's the best way to do it. It's a people-based democracy and not a, a money-based democracy. We share the work, we share ideas. It is about cooperation. Coming together for the benefit of everyone. To make the world a better place. Honesty, openness, about caring for others. And not only just talking about those things, but making those things real. A cooperative is a business. It's a different way of running a business. It's a better way of running a business. Helping everybody to have a voice to get things done. Put something back into society to make a difference. Give people opportunities to make the best of themselves. And you're sharing a common goal. It doesn't matter whether it's just two of you or two thousand. It really releases everybody's energies and everybody's abilities. We are born cooperative. There's still lots of people saying, well, yo, let's be selfish because it's the only way. Well, that's not the only way. For me, it's a way of doing business, but doing business ethically. The idea that it's OK to make money and to have ethics at the same time. When you succeed, it's always a pleasure to share the success with others. The principles run through cooperatives in the same way that the words Blackpool run through a stick of rock. They're integral to that stick of rock. Why would you not be passionate about cooperatives? It's about changing the world. It's about people coming together. It's about doing things for yourself and with other people rather than being done to. Democracia, el valor de la persona frente al valor del dinero. The cooperative movement can happen anywhere where there is cooperation. They can absolutely transform their lives and those of their communities. If you're part of it, you feel like you want to do more for something, and then have like more of a say. Once you've been um, infected by cooperation, that's it, it's in your blood. There is gradually a realisation that this is a better way to do business. Equal share of profits, one member, one vote. It's about concern for community. For mutual benefit. Equality and fairness. Solidarity. The model for the future. Yeah, I think it works everywhere. It's true. Shared responsibilities. It's really rewarding. It's how you make a better society. It's about self-help, self-responsibility. It's honest, it's ethical. The way to go. We're in it together. Cooperatives change lives. I've seen them work, I know they work, and I know if we put them in place, many, many people will benefit. We've come uh, out of a, a very special year for the cooperative uh, sector. Many people date the start of the cooperative business model to the year 1844, which was the setting up of a cooperative in, in Rochdale. And if you go to travel to Rochdale, visit Rochdale, um, it's a kind of tough area to tell you the truth, but it has sort of painted in graffiti over the kind of bridges you go under the, the, the world capital of cooperation. Uh, it was voted that by Latin American cooperators of last year, so someone in Rochdale picked up on it. But uh, you can look at other dates and other places as, as well. But last year, 2012, was named by the United Nations as the International Year of Cooperatives which is a rather special uh, gift uh, to, uh, to have over the, uh, the year. So there was sort of a General Assembly uh, debate at the beginning of the year and then a whole series of things that happened over the course uh, of the year. That little film we did for the, for the start of the year uh, as well. And one of the things we did was to collect together the statistics and data uh, on the cooperative sector in the, uh, the UK. And I'll just go through... Uh, some of these. In the session earlier, I talked about a different pattern of value creation 
in cooperatives. Uh, in business at large, particularly with the availability of finance and the free movement of capital in and out of enterprises, the, the kind of the, the curve, the graph for value creation can be incredibly uh, vertical, either up or kind of down. Whereas cooperatives tend to pursue a more evolutionary path uh, of growth. Often that reflects the finance model. Cooperatives are businesses that are owned not by external shareholders, uh, but they're owned by members, people that are involved in the, uh, the business. Uh, what we've seen over the last uh, five years is a steady pattern of, uh, of, of growth across the cooperative uh, sector uh, itself. So a kind of a sense that actually there's a sort of, there's a, there's a stable path uh, that is there. But also resilience uh, at a time when the wider uh, economy has actually been turning, uh, turning down. We have cooperatives uh, right across uh, the, the nations of the, of the UK. Uh, one example from uh, Scotland uh, is on the Isle of Uig. And I don't know if anybody has uh, visited uh, Uig at all. Um, no, well, the people talk about local food. Local food is very important. Tim Crabtree here is, is something of an expert on local food. He's done a lot of work researching it. Um, you can't find anybody with a bad word to say about local food. Except on Uig, you can. <laughs> Uh, and Douglas Adams as well, a science fiction writer. I'll tell you what he said in a minute. But on Oig, um, they had essentially that the shops uh, had closed down, and so they were living locally, living essentially off uh, swede uh, and cabbage and potatoes. Now that's great. Cabbage soup today at lunchtime was absolutely wonderful. Anybody involved in making that? Thank you very much. That was gorgeous. But particularly at this time of year, and in the UK, this period, March, April, is known as the hungry gap. Because actually we don't really have the new produce that has emerged. And, you know, we've, we've used up our winter stores, haven't we? And we don't really, nothing's quite emerged as yet. It's sort of, you know, May things start to take, take off. So Elaine Newton was uh, one member of uh, a community shop, a cooperative in Uig, which started five uh, years uh, ago. Uh, the members of the cooperative were all of the people that lived on the, uh, the island. They wanted a shop uh, for the island. So they all became uh, members uh, and put in money to get the shop running. But they also needed something else, which is that they needed deliveries through from uh, somewhere at a reasonable cost. And they got those from uh, a national cooperative called the Cooperative Group, which is the largest consumer-owned cooperative <coughs> in the, uh, the UK. And Elaine Newton, when she, she, she says this, she's very um, clear about the difference it makes. She says... Uh, we used to have a diet of Swedes, potatoes and cabbage. Now, she says, we can get mushrooms, figs and more. Not local, I know, from the deliveries we get three times a week. So deliveries coming across to the island. And the, the charges for those are no different to the Ui community shop than if there were deliveries in uh, Glasgow or, or somewhere downtown. And that's a decision that the national cooperative had made, that they had this infrastructure for delivery and they were going to serve these shops on the <coughs> islands uh, off the coast of Scotland. And Elaine goes on to say, there's no doubt without the cooperative and access to all the goods we can get here, there'd be no community shop. We're at the far edge of the country, the next shop is a hundred mile round trip. She says the community would die without a shop we could survive the closure of a community centre, but not the shop. It's inconceivable. And now, coming out of that shop, they have a local post office, which also supports local businesses. So there's a, a beef jerky supplier uh, that works on the, uh, on the island, but uses the, the post office now to actually distribute across the UK. In the summer months, the tourists come in, 
and sort of turnover doubles, but the shop is there all the way uh, through, uh, through the year. So an example, if you like, of, of how the cooperatives uh, may work, but also to be found uh, right across the, uh, the UK. Talked a little bit about uh, that. Again, in terms of um, uh, the interest in, in cooperatives at the moment is, is very high. And this interest comes from different sectors uh, and, and, and different kind of approaches that are uh, taking off. But what we've seen is a, a revival and a renaissance of the cooperative business model over the last uh, four or five years. So around 6,000 uh, enterprises. Now those come in all kinds of different scale uh, and you have this sort of manic minisculism of kind of cooperative woodlands uh, or, or uh, you know biofuels or, or, or farmers getting together for anaerobic digestion uh, or football clubs coming together to be owned by the, the fans, credit unions, people coming together to share savings and loans uh, on a cooperative uh, basis. So you have that sort of manic minisculism and then you have the much larger cooperatives that have been operating for quite some time. I gave the example of Lincolnshire Cooperative Society uh, kind of earlier today which was founded in 1860 and operates in every village across the county uh, of, uh, of Lincolnshire. So there's some much larger businesses as, as well as, as then in the sort of, you know, uh, sort of mid-cap, the sort of middle-sized cooperatives as well. And what's interesting about that is that it allows you the space to create a kind of solidarity economy. Because often in the, the wider field of, of, of social or ecological enterprise, and I count cooperatives as, 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 as that, you're always trying to pull yourself up from the bootstraps and you're always trying to do things in some ways at small scale, often over-trading uh, or undercapitalized for doing what you're trying to do. But the interesting thing about the cooperative sector is that we have some larger businesses that are able to <coughs> joint venture and partner smaller businesses in the same way that the UI community shop was able to, uh, to get going. And one of the things that some of the larger cooperatives, Cooperative Group, for example, do is to support a, uh, a business advice line for new cooperatives. So anybody wanting to start a cooperative uh, can get access through to five days specialist advice, depending on your needs. And it may be legal advice, it may be business advice, maybe financial planning uh, or, the, uh, or the like. So the numbers of cooperatives uh, at the moment, at least in the UK, uh, is, uh, is growing. Now I said that cooperatives are owned by members. This is the idea that you have a business and that you can give ownership to those people who are involved most closely in the business itself. And those can be the people that work in the business, uh, employee ownership. It can be the customers of the business, a consumer-owned model. Uh, it can be the suppliers of the business, enterprises mm -hmm. that come together, or it can be a mix of all of those. I talked about cooperative schools, for example. That's a sort of multi-stakeholder model. It's a very ugly word, but it's a rather beautiful concept that you can bring the different groups involved together <coughs> and have a democratic model whereby they are electing essentially the board that oversees the activity, in this case of a school. So a cooperative school has got teachers, children, parents, community groups involved as constituencies electing the board uh, on the school uh, itself. A lot of this going on just the other side of, of Plymouth in Cornwall uh, uh, was a real uptake and upsurge uh, of cooperative schools. Now these are schools that have been state schools, uh, their academies or trusts, uh, but they are using the values because they appreciate the values. Sometimes they're actually people that would have stayed within the public sector, public values, but actually they feel that's under threat and they move to the cooperative model as a, as a way of saving it. 
Now, the membership numbers are, are, are therefore quite large. The cooperative group has got six and a half million uh, members, and that's a national uh, cooperative. Uh, and then, you know, others will be kind of added uh, on there. So we've got 13 and a half uh, million uh, members or memberships uh, across, the, uh, across the UK. I'll come on uh, to give some of the international figures, which are uh, much larger as, as well. In terms of the UK uh, cooperative uh, sector, the, uh, the dominant area uh, is, uh, is retail. And this differs across different uh, countries. Uh, in France, for example, um, I was in France last week, and it's agricultural cooperatives uh, that are the core to the French cooperative sector, along with uh, cooperative banks, uh, Credit Agricole and others. Uh, a, a lot of the, the wine production, all champagne, for example, in France, is produced with a cooperative uh, involved at some level. That's kind of nice, actually, to have within the cooperative sector. You know, if you, when you're in for the long term, you have to celebrate the points as you, as you go. And in the retail sector here, interestingly enough, we've got all of the different types of models of membership ownership. So we have cooperative food shops, which are consumer-owned, um, uh, pioneer in terms of fair trade, and moving towards a kind of, if it can be fair trade, it will be uh, model. So if you can get a commodity as a fair trade commodity, then actually it'll be stocked as a fair trade commodity uh, rather, than, rather than not. Um, we have employee-owned models, so John Lewis, Waitrose, uh, the high end uh, is, a, is a cooperative model. And we also have a cooperative of local independent shopkeepers that come together in a membership uh, cooperative to buy in bulk and buy cheaper and support and sustain local independent uh, shopkeepers. Uh, and that's called NISA and it's a symbol group. So we have all of those different models uh, in, the, uh, in the UK. Agriculture uh, is the, uh, the second uh, kind of largest area uh, in the UK, and that can be marketing uh, cooperatives or it can be uh, kind of um, distribution cooperatives uh, as well. Uh, Ribena uh, is a much loved British drink. Uh, Ribena, all of the berries that go into uh, Ribena come from a cooperative. Uh, and it was an interesting example, actually, of, um, I think it may be Unilever that own uh, Ribena, ultimately. It's hard to follow all of the kind of, you know, the corporate tracks. But the farmers that supply uh, kind of Ribena decided to come together that actually they'd get better value. So they created a cooperative, but they had to make it work as well for Ribena. There was no point simply saying, well, we're just going to demand more that actually they had to involve them and, and show how operating as a cooperative meant that they could reinvest in the farms, build better quality of supply throughout. So it was looking as a cooperative, not just for their own interests, but through the, uh, the value chain. And then in financial services uh, as well, and I talked about credit union, savings and loans cooperatives, uh, originated probably in Germany. Uh, in the late 19th century, the Raffaisen uh, model. You can't actually open a, a credit union now in Germany. The regulations have, have shifted. Uh, they have other cooperative banks in, in Germany. Uh, and then we have the cooperative uh, bank, and we have uh, building societies uh, as, uh, you know, as, as well. Cooperative bank has been voted the world's most sustainable bank, uh, I think two or three times, and Europe's most sustainable bank, I think, for each of the last... Uh, three, three years. So it's put ethics at the heart of what it does. One of the things we've seen over the last year is, a, is the campaign uh, called Move Your Money. Uh, and it's a beautiful campaign. It's a very simple campaign. Uh, it says that if you have money in with one of the banks that caused the problems in terms of the credit crunch, then why not move your money to a bank that wasn't involved in that way, a cooperative or a mutual bank. It's something that started in the States uh, with uh, Bank Transfer Day and then the sort of Move Your Money campaign. And is a group, an activist group, that's been running it here in the UK 
coming out of UK uncut and elsewhere. Mm. And half a million people have moved their bank account in line with the campaign aims over the last 12 months. Uh, Nationwide has picked up kind of a lot of, uh, of that, has, has others as well, some of the smaller ethical ones as well, like, uh, like Triodos. It's rather <coughs> different to the model that you get from the news, where, well, there's not a lot you can do, and we don't like banks, uh, but switching is difficult. And actually, switching has been made easy. It only takes 10 days. Once you decide, then it's 10 working days and all of the work is done by the bank that you move towards. And that's going to be taken down to five days, uh, we hope, in the budget uh, this, you know, this week. So the campaign emerging around there and financial services uh, is, is core. Uh, internationally, I'd say, uh, across Europe, uh, cooperative financial services is much stronger than it is, has been in the UK. The UK has had a very centralised model of banking. Um, I think it was uh, you know, sometime in the 18th century when there was a, a bank on, on the Clyde uh, uh, investing in shipbuilding and the bank w- collapsed. And at that point, the Bank of England st- stepped in and made sure that all of these little local regional banks were basically kind of um, closed down. So we've had a very centralised banking system for hundreds of years in the, the UK, which is very different to other countries. Uh, Germany, for example, much more regional and cooperative banking. Netherlands, uh, 40% uh, uh, cooperative banking. And across Europe, cooperative banks have got 20% uh, market share overall. And are the proportion of investing in small, small and medium-sized businesses has increased since the, the credit crunch uh, rather than gone down. So what's, some, uh, what's trending? Uh, some examples. Uh, in retailing, uh, what we're seeing is that the cooperative model is a way of uh, saving uh, village shops and some urban shops as well. I gave you the example of the um, the Uig community shop earlier. And what we're finding is that it is a brutal market out there for retail. uh, Because you can shop online, you can go to big supermarkets, uh, all of these things which um, you wouldn't dream of doing, of course, if you come to Schumacher. Well, online, of course you would. but, But it's a brutal market, the retail market. And if you're in a village, margins are so tight that actually it's not that if we have all of you shopping in the village shop, that actually you all say, no, I'm going to go and shop at, so, you know, national supermarket, out-of-town supermarket, you know, 10 miles away, or something like that. It's that the four of you might decide that you're going to shop elsewhere or get it delivered online. And if the four of you step out then actually the margins are so tight that the village shop will close. So that actually you lose the choice collectively because of the individual choice that people have. The shop closes for all. Now in this case, the cooperative model works very well because uh, you are getting people bought back in in terms of loyalty to the local shop. So if you're faced with a village where the shop is going to close, actually people rally together. We're finding now it's, it's still a small minority, but it's one in ten village shops in a rural setting that are closing, and that's an accelerating trend, are saved using the cooperative uh, kind of model. And the reason why it works is that the cooperative model invites people in to put money up, This is a business proposition, so you could lose your money. It's not a charitable donation. But to put money up to buy the shop or to run the shop. But as you own the shop, you're also more likely to be loyal and shop there as well. So you may be able to run these on a cooperative basis, whereby you could not uh, on another basis. And there's an organisation called the Plunkett Foundation, which is one of our members that does a lot of this work. So we're seeing that emerge in in retailing. And there's some real creativity there as well. Uh, There was one village that uh, the shop closed down and 
Uh, they just did not have time to respond, and the shop was sold. But they really, really wanted a shop in the village. Uh, they thought it was essential to the life and soul of the village. So they looked around at all the buildings, thought, where on earth could we put a shop? And they alighted on the toilets, the public toilets. They were there, they were nice, big, local authority built toilets with men over there, women over there, and it wasn't that big, but there was the space to uh, rebuild it, uh, local architects squeeze down the toilet space a bit and create a shop in the middle. And my colleague Peter, who does a lot of work on this, says it's the finest example of, you know, convenience retailing <laughs> that you can find. There's a lot of creativity here. Cooperative schools I've touched on, uh, and this is partly introduced through policy changes, so this is primarily in England, one or two in, in, in Northern Ireland as well, but we now have 400 <coughs> cooperative schools uh, across uh, England in a very, very dynamic sphere with its own cooperative network uh, that has emerged. And that's really been sort of doubling in numbers over the last sort of six uh, or, uh, or seven years. And some of that is simply in response to, as I say, a kind of a model of marketisation of schools, of encouraging schools to stand on their own two feet uh, and essentially to see a kind of a market model that actually people thinking, no, we prefer to be cooperative. Uh, and renewable energy is another area uh, for, uh, for trending. And this is, uh, you, you'll find cooperatives in every part of the energy field. Uh, there's uh, uh, Cooperative Energy, which is a, a retailer, uh, which has emerged in the last year or two to kind of challenge the big six energy companies. But in this area, I'm talking about energy generation. Uh, so renewable energy, uh, kind of wind or, or biomass or, you know, all forms, uh, kind of really. Um, example would be Ovesco in Lewis, came out of the Transition Town uh, network in Lewis. They've done lots of work on... Uh, demand side responses, behaviour, behaviour around sustainable energy and, uh, and climate change. Uh, and then they've moved into uh, energy generation. And what they've done is to put uh, solar panels, in this case, uh, onto the roof of the local brewery, uh, Harvey's Brewery, which is a much loved uh, beer, highly recommended uh, if you're visiting. Uh, the, the UK, and it created something that was a, a beautiful model, not just in terms of the business there around energy, but something that was a cultural icon uh, as well, that helped to create space for that kind of change. The link between economic activity and social change is very close in the cooperative model. In ways, it's the business model of choice for social change, because they, it's a model of people organising, uh, so it fits quite naturally. Uh, Fritz Schumacher, E.F. Yeah, Schumacher, himself was the founder of uh, a, a model or a, of action called Intermediate Technology, uh, the charity now called Practical Action in the UK. But his argument was that you needed to promote forms of technology that allowed for uh, people to work so they were labour intensive and that was the model of technology you didn't, have to, you didn't just have to accept what technology Apple gave you I'm not sure Apple was around in his day but you get the idea um, and I remember many years ago when I was at the New Economics Foundation uh, we were asked to do a, an evaluation of this intermediate technology uh, kind of field and we did this evaluation and one of the main things we found was that what was really exciting wasn't just the, the you know, the micro-hydro, you know, renewable energy turbine that was generating kind of, you know, sort of uh, energy or, 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 or kind of, you know, money flow. It was that actually it allowed social change to happen, that people's roles changed where these things were put in. 
And I have to say then, actually, a few years after that, um, we were invited to come back and do another one. And what we found is actually that the message had got slightly wrong and that the organisation had got into the idea that actually really what it was about was about social change, not about technology. And actually it had, looking back, reflecting, made the mistake of thinking that it was there to try and mobilise people around issues. Whereas actually it was the technology that created the space for people to organise. So the two went hand in, uh, in hand. And that would be the case for cooperative models as well. Uh, Ivan Illich talks about tools for conviviality, things that create space for people to do things a little bit differently. And these would be examples uh, of that. Now, a lot of these, um, uh, the renewable energy one in particular, talks also to a, a wider policy framework. But some of these, you know, you, you can't swim, you know, up, uh, up river uh, on some of these. Um, and in the case of renewable energy, we're campaigning at the moment around policies that are coming forward, which are about energy policy as a whole. And that's one of the characteristics, I think, of sustainable businesses, is that they have to be willing to campaign on issues of sustainability. It is not just enough to look at what you do as a business, you have to align yourself with social movements that are trying to, uh, to make uh, change. And in terms of climate change, uh, issues like tar sands, but also uh, energy policy, we've certainly seen that. These are some examples, this is, excuse the phrasing, but uh, rock stars. Uh, cooperative energy is, uh, now cooperative energy is a, is a good example to introduce you to how the underlying model of the cooperative uh, kind of works. Uh, and it's a model that dates back to the, the Rochdale pioneers. Uh, two dozen uh, people in Rochdale in the 19th century, uh, weavers, uh, you know, poor working class people, um, working together. Nowadays, you know, you couldn't talk about 24 Rochdale pioneers, you'd have to say one of them was a social entrepreneur and everybody else was just sort of hanging along. But no, they were working together in that kind of way. But one mistake that, that people often think, they often think that cooperatives are a non-profit model. And by saying that you're not for profit, that actually then you can win people's trust because you're obviously not out to profiteer. And, and that works as a communications device but it's not an easy way to run a business. Because if you run a business as a non-profit model, then the first year you make a loss, you go bust. Because you have no reserves, no assets uh, to fall back on. So cooperatives are for-profit models. But the profit is distributed through back to the, uh, the owners. Uh, and this is how it does it. In the case of cooperative energy, uh, it operates in the energy sphere and it pays a dividend back to the, the members of the cooperative. The very first cooperative, Rochdale, in Rochdale Pioneers, started off with five products, like flour, uh, candles, uh, butter, and it asked itself, what is a just price? What is a fair price to charge if actually you, the customers, own the shop. And that idea of a just price is something that's got, had a long history to it. And what the Rochdale pioneers developed was a, a model that was stable. There had been different attempts before. And what they said was, Robin comes in to buy his, his flour, we'll charge a price that covers the costs of production and enough to keep the business going uh, into the future. Anything additional that we make will give back to him and to other members in the form of a dividend, uh, you know, when at the end of the year or on a quarterly basis. And we'll do so in, in respect to how much they've actually used the shop. So the idea of a cooperative <coughs> dividend is really a balancing item for a just and fair price. And it's a rather subtle point 
but it's a very different way of thinking about a, a business. Uh, the Wine Society uh, is one. I was talking about the Wine Society earlier uh, today, uh, saying that one of the things I like about the Wine Society, I don't know if you, any of you are members of the Wine Society here, they are absolutely fabulous. They, they, they provide very, very high quality uh, kind of wines, and they do so at the cheapest price they can. Um, and so on that same model, this is a business that if you look at their accounts, their profit levels are very low. If you're coming in as an investor or a venture capitalist, you'd say, this is mad. You've got a quarter of a million members. They trust you. Uh, you know, there's incredible trust. The service quality is, uh, is superb. You should be charging more to make far more of a profit. But that's not what they're there for. They're owned by their members, so they're trying to keep prices as low as they can. I've got some nice quotes, example, actually. Of, of the, the, um, the, the, the wine is delivered, so it's sort of handed over. And because it's owned by the, um, the, the members, they get to know the, uh, the, the drivers quite well. And there were some nice little notices that I picked up from Sarah, who's the, the chair of the Wine Society. This is um, the kind of message that you don't want your wine going missing, after all. You can imagine yourself in that context. So one message uh, was uh, for the driver, leave by the front door and mark it, caution, swine fever. <laughs> Another one wrote again for a, a driver delivering, if out, leave in the outhouse, not with neighbours. <laughs> Dog friendly, cat scared, ducks for sale. <laughs> The Wine Society has been going since the late um, uh, 19th century, actually. Uh, it was the Wine Exhibition Society uh, Cooperative. And again, one of the things I like about the Wine Society uh, is that it is just the Wine Society. It's not the Wine and Cheese Society, and it's not the Wine and Cheese and Subprime Mortgages <laughs> Society. They know what they're there, they focus on uh, what, uh, what they are uh, doing and the cooperative bank I've, uh, I have mentioned. <coughs> when we look um, uh, worldwide, um, we see that there are cooperatives, um, particularly in the food area, behind uh, many of the, the products that uh, that we may know. I've touched on Champagne <coughs> and uh, Ribena, uh, Bird's Eye, the Green Pea uh, Cooperative. Uh, is, uh, is one. Uh, Lerpak, uh, Denmark is a very, uh, you know, cooperative country, although it's so embedded in the nation that sometimes people don't even see it. You know, cooperative uh, wind farms, you hear more about it sometimes about that as a cooperative success story outside of Denmark than inside where you just take it all for granted. I uh, don't know if you'd agree, but kind of Lerpak and others, or Danish farmers have been formidably successful uh, at developing uh, those, uh, those models. Ocean Spray uh, is an American farmer cooperative of cranberry growers and an example of coming together for innovation. Uh, that cranberries are... Cranberries are really not very nice. I mean, uh, I don't want to be down on potato, swede and cabbage and cranberries as well because <laughs> that's very un Schumacher. but cranberries are really not very nice and so uh, actually... They, and yet, that was the place to grow them, that was the valley to grow them. So the, the farmers came together to look at product development to see what they could do with cranberries. And they came up with Ocean Spray Cranberry Juice, uh, which is now a very kind of well-known and well-marketed uh, kind of brand. Uh, and they did that and they created that product uh, and that market uh, by coming together uh, in a... Uh, in a cooperative, uh, in a cooperative way. Now, I said that last year was the international uh, year of cooperatives, and one of the things that we were able to do was to bring together the figures, looking at the uh, the sheer scale uh, of the cooperative sector, uh, kind of world uh, worldwide. So uh, we found that there are nine hundred million member owners of cooperatives. Uh, worldwide, which is a staggering uh, number of people. Um, and then when you look 
and compare that with the number of people, for example, that invest in the stock market, uh, what you find is that there are far more member owners of cooperative enterprises around the world than there are individuals who invest in the stock market. Even if you look at that indirectly, so people who are investing through pensions funds or long-term savings funds uh, or the like, there are more people that are member owners of cooperatives than there are people that have uh, an investment or ownership stake uh, in, the, uh, in the stock market. The numbers of people that are employed by cooperatives uh, around the world is more than uh, all of the multinational corporations uh, put uh, together. And you'll find different places across the world different cooperative models that have emerged. Uh, I described the UK scene for you, but if you know we were in uh, Spain, it would be very different. There's a very strong tradition of uh, worker cooperatives and, and hugely successful uh, within that, as, as, as well as others uh, there as well. Uh, in Argentina, when Argentina went through its own austerity uh, in around 2000, firms were going bust, the currency was devalued, uh, Argentina had defaulted on its debt, um, and workers took over the businesses that were going bust in order to run them as worker cooperatives. Uh, and it was a very successful model. They then had to be legalised and legitimised, uh, which the majority of them were kind of over, over time. In Australia, there's a, uh, a cooperative of garage owners, because garages are so spread across Australia. So you have individuals that, you know, that are running their own car re repair shop or the like, and they come together uh, in a, a very effective cooperative called uh, Capricorn, an enterprise-owned uh, cooperative. Uh, and in Africa, then you'll have farmer cooperatives like Quapa Coco that produces chocolate uh, for uh, uh, divine uh, chocolate and for uh, you know, Kit Kats too. Three quarters of all fair trade comes from cooperatives. And the first fair trade was started by a cooperative indeed uh, in Mexico. In the States, we have telecoms and broadband cooperatives. Uh, very effective, and a lot of the rural electrification was done uh, in the early years uh, through, the, uh, through the cooperative uh, model. So it is a, uh, an international uh, field and an international uh, model uh, that is there. Oh, that's for tomorrow. <laughs> so in conclusion, and without stepping out and opening up, as, of course, in the time that we have, to any questions and challenges. I hope that that's given you a sense of the contours of the cooperative uh, sector in the UK, uh, but also uh, internationally. It is a, it's a great field to work in. Some of the work that we'll be doing tomorrow is looking in a little bit more depth about what model works in what situation. Uh, the point about cooperatives is that you are you're a slightly different type of business, and it's how do you use that for commercial advantage? What are the disadvantages? What are the advantages? And where can you make those, uh, those work? In the cooperative sector, it's, not a, it's a, not a very intellectual sector. It's a very practical sector. Again, another thing that Schumacher said once was, an ounce of practice is worth a tonne of theory. So it is quite a practical movement focused on business and making a success of business, but with a strong people focus and a strong set of values in what it does uh, throughout. Thank you very much.